From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Federal Reserve weighs the largest increase in interest rates in more than 25 years as primary results from Tuesday provide another test of President Trump's influence over the GOP. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by my colleagues, columnists Joe Sternberg and Kim Strassel. Welcome to you both. Friday's inflation report from the Labor Department showed consumer prices up 8.6% compared with a year ago, the highest in 40 years. That included big increases in food and energy, but also so-called core inflation of 6% triple the Fed's target, and now the Fed is considering whether to raise interest rates by 75 basis points, which would be the largest jump since 1994. We are taping this before the afternoon announcement, so keep that in mind. But Joe, is this the kind of move that the Fed needs to make to tame inflation? And do you think it has the stomach to stay the course? Well, so I mean, on your first question, is this what they should be doing or what they need to do? I think the answer is probably yes, because the Fed has found itself in the situation where it's fighting a rear guard action to maintain its basic credibility as an inflation fighter. And I think that that kind of institutional credibility is an important piece of the puzzle when you're talking about inflation. And so the Fed has not done itself any favors by falling behind. And I think that what's happened over the course of the past few months is that they had thought that they would be able to get back onto the curve as opposed to behind the curve uh, if they signaled that they were going to do these half percentage point or 50 basis point increases at their meetings for the rest of the year, which already would have been pretty unusual since the Fed is normally comfortable moving in 25 basis point increments. I think that what has happened is they've seen these inflation numbers stay elevated and not responding to what they've done already and not responding to what the financial markets have done already in response to the Fed. I think the Fed is concluding that they were going to have to bring out some bigger guns, which is why all of a sudden the past few days you have this talk about a 75 basis point increase. But the rhetoric from President Biden on this topic doesn't seem to have changed as the underlying facts seem to have changed. And on Tuesday, the president addressed the Quadrennial Constitutional Convention of the AFL-CIO Labor Organization. One of the big topics there was inflation. And here is part of what Biden said. My plan is simple. First, I'm doing everything in my power to blunt Putin's gas price hike. Just since he invaded Ukraine, it's gone up a dollar seventy-four a gallon. Because of nothing else but that. So I have a plan to bring down the cost of gas and food. It's going to take time, but let the world coordinate the largest release. What I've been able to do, the largest release of oil from the global fund in history million barrels a day and 240 million barrels to boost global supply when I convinced other nations to join us. So, Kim, we're still talking about allegedly Putin's price hike. And President Biden has also sent browbeating letters to oil executives, including Exxon CEO Darren Woods. I'll read part of it. It says at a time of war, refinery profit margins well above normal being passed directly onto American families are not acceptable Continues, your companies need to work with my administration to bring forward concrete near-term solutions that address the crisis, unquote. And Kim, part of the dynamic, though, it seems to me, is that these CEOs know that as soon as gas prices go down again, right now they may be great patriots if they can help do that, but soon enough Biden will be sending them letters again, calling them enemies of the planet. Yeah, um, he sent that letter, by the way, not just to the Exxon CEO, but to six other companies, to Chevron, Shell, Phillips 66, BP, Marathon, Valero. Uh, This follows on the administration coming off a round of beating up gas retailers, claiming that they were responsible, and Democrats in Congress suggesting that they were going to hold hearings over 
price gouging. There's been lots of complaints supposedly about Wall Street titans who are engaging in gas speculation. Everyone is to blame except for this administration. And I actually, my eye was caught more by a different letter that was sent by the American Petroleum Institute to the White House detailing 10 steps it might take to actually get more oil and gas production in the country, starting with putting back on the market the gas and oil lease sales that the administration canceled just last month. We've talked about this before. This is an administration that is strangling domestic oil and gas supply and then wants to blame everybody else for some of the resulting hikes that are coming. Some of that is obviously due to Putin's invasion of the Ukraine, but I would note that a huge portion of the run-up in gas prices that he was just talking came well before Putin invaded, and you can't claim that all of the hike that has come since the invasion is entirely on Ukraine. This is also a domestic issue as well, too. So we'll see if they can get away with blaming others. It's a weird strategy to me because it hasn't helped them so far. Blaming Putin, blaming COVID and supply chains, blaming greedy companies. None of it really matters to the consumers that are having to fork out their dollars and are struggling increasingly every month. And as long as the administration pretends as if it's other people's fault rather than their own policies, they'll just continue to see these numbers rise. And I also think it is mixing up a couple of things that are really sort of separate phenomena. And one of them is this underlying inflation, and the other are swings in prices of volatile categories like food and energy. Some of those swings might be related to the Ukraine war, the shutting down of imports of Russian oil imports to the West. And the last time we talked about inflation, we got a letter from a listener, and he said, we have a preacher who always assumes that this might be the first day ever or the first day in a long time that listeners are in church. And he suggests we do the same thing with inflation, starting with the old Milton Friedman quote that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. Or a simpler version of that might be too much money chasing too few goods and services. And definitely I think that is going on here, particularly in that core inflation number that economists always talk about. I would also point to an op-ed the journal has today from a couple of economists, including a former president of the Philadelphia Fed. And they say that they're pointing to some of the pandemic relief programs. And they say in response to the 9% decline in real gross domestic product in the pandemic-ridden first half of 2020, Congress and the president enacted deficit spending legislation of 27% of GDP. So just to repeat those numbers, they're saying the GDP went down by 9% and Congress compensated by spending 27% of GDP. So Joe, how do you separate these things and parcel out blame for what we're seeing now in the economy and how much of it really is on policymakers in D.C.? Well, I think you start in the right place, Kyle, when you were reminding us that inflation is fundamentally a phenomenon of too much money chasing too few goods. And I think that now, I mean, certainly in policymaking circles, there is some grudging recognition on the too much money side. This is very muted in the political branches where I think the Democrats in particular are anxious to throw even more money into the economy by reviving the Build Back Better agenda. But at least at the Fed, there is an assumption that there has to be something done that will kind of tamp down on some of the excess money that's floating around out there, even if the Fed itself won't necessarily speak in those terms. The other half of that equation, though, the chasing too few goods, and we have to ask ourselves, why are there too few goods and services in this kind of economy, particularly if employment has been as strong as it's been over the past year. Clearly, people were raring to go after the pandemic lockdowns were lifted. And that answer has a lot to do with the policy environment. I mean, going back to the kind of point that Kim was making in energy, I mean, you can expand that across the economy to a range of regulatory policies or tax policies that are just making it very difficult for the economy to respond to these price signals. I mean, conventionally, what would happen if the price of things go up is that that should stimulate more investment in producing those things because the market will detect a profit opportunity. If that is not happening, we need to be very curious about why not. That kind of curiosity is not something that 
Washington is interested in at the moment. And to the point about Biden continuing to push his Build Back Better agenda, or at least pieces of it, I will point to a few things that he told the AFL-CIO. Again, he was talking about pushing tax increases, the need for companies to pay their fair share. He said, we're making Buy American a reality, not just a slogan. I award no contracts from the federal government unless they can prove they bought it in America And if there are building projects that need steel, I don't know why we shouldn't be looking around for the most competitive price of steel to get the best bang for our buck when we spend on infrastructure. A third is this Build Back Better proposal to subsidize child care. He said families shouldn't have to pay more than 7% of your income for that. We could easily afford to do that, which to my eye looks like subsidizing demand. What could possibly go wrong? I also, Kim, don't quite understand the White House's reluctance to try some policies that could help move prices in the other direction. And the one I would point to is taking off some of the Trump tariffs. There was a paper recently by the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and it said that a feasible package of trade liberalization could do a one-time reduction in the consumer price index of around 1.3 percentage points. And granted, that is not the be all end all solution to the inflation problem, Kim. But if you're looking at eight and a half percent inflation and the president could take one point off that with a swish of his pen, I don't know why they aren't looking more seriously at doing it. (laughs) Well, the answer is because it's political and it goes to what you were saying earlier about the president saying that we need to buy American goods In some ways, and this is probably not a position most people can take on board easily, you almost have to feel a little sorry for the Fed in a way. They are very much responsible for a lot of the mess that we are in. As Joe was saying, though, they at least have this grudging acknowledgement that there is too much money supply out there and that we have this supply demand imbalance. And they're now doing something about it with rate hikes. The Biden administration just is floating around there, taking no responsibility for the money it injected in the economy with its vast spending bill that came in March of 2021. And it's not doing the one thing that it has the ability to do that the Fed doesn't necessarily have any ability to engage in, which is to increase supply of goods and services. This was obviously Ronald Reagan's great contribution to pulling us out of the inflationary times of the late 70s and early 80s. And instead, he's proposing policy after policy that is the exact opposite. So as you said, Kyle, the refusal to not deal with tariffs, the constant threats that are being leveled at CEOs of greater taxes and more punishing regulations. If you're a CEO, why would you want to build a new factory and hire new workers and produce new goods and take that risk, knowing that the United States government is going to do all it possibly can to make it more expensive and harder for you to go down that road. And that even if you were successful, it's then going to take away half of what you earn by virtue of the fact that you are a successful businessman. That's not really the environment that encourages anybody to produce. And so it is very worrisome to me because we're now in a bit of a spiral here. It's great to see the Fed potentially moving and with some alacrity, but we are missing that key ingredient that helped us get out of a similar time. And that would be the kind of Reagan type approach that understands the other side of the supply equation. Well, we'll see how much the Fed moves up interest rates today. It seems that there are growing rumblings, Joe, that it may push us into a recession by raising rates or that maybe we are in a recession already and we just don't know it yet. We're still waiting on the data to say that definitively. Do you think that there's a real risk that a recession or a rise in the unemployment rate could deter the Fed from doing what it needs to get this inflation under control? Well, I think that historically that has always been a problem for the Fed because they come under growing pressure whenever the economy turns south you know, to try to do something about it and to do something about it more quickly, perhaps, than Congress or, or the White House can. It's a good sign, and it speaks well for Chairman Jerome Powell, who often comes in for a lot of criticism on this podcast. I mean, to be fair, it does speak well for him He seems to be prepared to float the possibility of the 75 basis point rate increase this week. That So far, he does not seem deterred by the downturn that we've had on Wall Street 
or over the past few days. And I think that that is important because historically Fed chairmen have also had this difficulty with getting frightened by the market into kind of you know, maybe pulling their feet off of the brake or even tapping the gas pedal a little bit more. So Jerome Powell is passing that test. But it's definitely true. I mean, people talk about the Reagan-Paul Volcker dynamic of the early 80s as if Reagan had a few meetings with Paul Volcker and said, well, okay, Paul, you go ahead and do what you have to do, and I will make speeches backing you up. I mean, there was definitely an element of that rhetorical support from Reagan. But the more important thing that happened there that made it possible for the Fed to really tough out the political pressure that came when there was a recession in the early 80s was the fact that Reagan was really committed to unlocking the supply side of the economy with tax and regulatory policy. And so right now, Biden is promising rhetorical support for the Fed, including in our pages in an op-ed that the president wrote a few weeks ago. But he's not acting like he means it. And I think that that lack of action from the White House is going to be a major political threat to the Fed's project of trying to normalize monetary policy. Hang tight. We'll be right back. You're listening to Potomac Watch from The Wall Street Journal. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Tuesday's primaries included some races in South Carolina. And Kim, there's maybe an interesting split decision here on President Trump's continuing influence over the GOP. So let's start with Congressman Tom Rice. He's a Republican who voted with President Trump about 90 percent of the time, but he also voted to impeach President Trump. And he has said that when it happened, colleagues were trying to reach out to him, thinking that maybe he had pressed the wrong button, but he had pressed the button that he wanted. And here he was yesterday on NBC News saying that he didn't regret that vote. Do you regret anything about voting to impeach? Absolutely not. Um, You know, I I knew when I took that vote that there would be some uh, blowback. Uh, But, you know, I'm, I'm hired to be the people's representative and to do to do the right thing, even when it's hard. Yeah. Well, uh, it, I don't vote. I, I don't. I don't vote to preserve my job. I vote to do the right thing. My allegiance is to the Constitution. But the voters in the seventh district have chosen instead a Trump-backed candidate, Russell Fry, and the latest results show Fry with about fifty-one percent of the vote. Here he is declaring victory on Tuesday night. Today, the conservatives in the Republican Party won. Today. Donald Trump won. And today, the voters of the 7th Congressional District won. Today, Republicans rose up en masse to reclaim our seat in Congress. Republicans expected our U.S. representative to accurately represent us and our conservative convictions in Washington. But this is not a win for Russell Fry. It's a huge win for we the people. On the other hand, Congresswoman Nancy Mace also won her re-election race, uh, her primary. She had said critical things about Trump and then tried to mend fences and defeated a Trump-backed challenger. So, Kim, what do you make of this split decision? Well, it's an interesting thing. I think it might say more about the way these two people ran their races overall, then it may say anything about impeachment or Donald Trump. And let me just explain why. I think it is notable that Rice lost. He is, it's the first time a pro-impeachment House member has lost in a primary. I mean, obviously a lot of attention because Donald Trump had endorsed the opponent, Russell Fry. But what was also notable about Tom Rice's campaign is that after he took that vote, he not only really leaned into impeachment, he kind of, as you heard in that clip, talked a lot about how he was a traditional Republican, a Chamber of Commerce Republican, 
and made the race about rejecting to a certain degree, not just Donald Trump, but the whole America first agenda, which, by the way, is something that's really popular with a lot of Americans, regardless of whether or not they are Trump supporters or not. It's a, you know, a very much a kind of whistle out there that people like to hear. And you even hear, by the way, that's why Joe Biden was talking about, you know, needing to buy American products. It's something that it resonates with a lot of Americans. By contrast, Nancy Mace, she didn't vote for impeachment. She did condemn Donald Trump in January 6th. She directly blamed him for it. She has gone back and forth and said nicer things about him since. But I think more notable overall, she ran a very much a kind of America first campaign. And so much so that it was interesting when she lost, and this is a rare thing to actually see, Donald Trump sent a note out saying nice things about her competitor, Kay Arrington, who actually lost. But he actually sent a congratulatory, said congrats to Nancy Mace, who should easily be able to defeat her Democratic opponent. It's not very often that somebody who beats a Trump candidate gets a nice note from him. This was on True Social, his new media platform. But I I think that his power of endorsement certainly matters. We can talk a little bit more about that. There's some interesting numbers. But I think that this also had to do with the way that these people ran their races. The other election I would highlight is in Texas, the 34th district in the Rio Grande Valley, where there was a special election to replace a resigning Democrat. And it has been won by Republican Myra Flores. This is a district that leans Democratic. I think it's something like 85 percent Hispanic I saw in one source. And Flores will be the first Mexican-born woman elected to Congress. And what's interesting about this, Kim, is my understanding is that this district has been redrawn and it will be up for election again in November and there will be an incumbent Democrat running in that election. And so it might be a harder race in November But the fact that it has been flipped in this special election suggests to me that Republicans are continuing to make inroads among Hispanic voters. And even if this Republican seat is not held in November, it does suggest the size of the wave. Kim, that I think is coming Democrats' way. Yes. So this district is a little funky. Congressperson Philemon Vila left the seat a couple months ago to go be a lobbyist. And also the district was then redrawn in a way, by the way, that makes it much more friendly to Democrats. And so Democrats as a whole had decided to essentially skip this special election and instead focus on the incumbent that they currently have, who's going to be running for the full two-year term this fall. That led to a lot of grumping among the top Democrat in this current race, the one that was just decided, Dan Sanchez, who spent a lot of time last night complaining about how little help Democrats gave him in this race. Overall, though, you are right. The National Republican Congressional Committee has targeted all of these border districts in South Texas as potential huge pickup opportunities. This has long been a Democratic stronghold. This, for instance, is the kind of area where Henry Cuellar, a longtime Democrat in Congress, has held his seat. That area The fact that they won this with this woman who ran a campaign, by the way, Myra Flores, very interesting. Um, As you said, a Mexican-born woman, a wife of a Border Patrol agent who spent a lot of time talking about that in her race. This is a sign of, and we've had a couple in the last elections too, the last presidential election and a few other special elections of primaries of this huge shift in Hispanic voters, at least in this area, and potentially the magnitude of specific issues like immigration across parties. And this is something that I think isn't getting as much attention right now as inflation or gas prices or overall consumer sentiment, but is nonetheless continues to be a huge liability for Democrats going into November. Thank you, Kim and Joe. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.